Happy Sabbath. Before we get started, let's just have a quick prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can be here this Sabbath day. We pray especially that your Spirit will be here among us. May the Spirit of your Holy Spirit be here amidst us. Jesus says he would be with us where two or three are gathered in your name. He's there as our teacher, and we sit at his feet, his disciples. Teach us, Father, and touch our lips with the coals of heaven. Bless us now as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Who's that woman? You know, chapter 17 is an important chapter to Adventists. And we've had a long history with that chapter. And unfortunately, some of us has gotten to the point to where we are so basic with the understanding. We know it so well that we end up actually dissenting ourselves from other people. Because we know who that woman is, right? And we make it plain. We make it known. And the thing that we want to emphasize is not only do we know who she is, we know we're not it. And what that sets up is a dichotomy. An us-them mentality. And any time we come to the end time, to the last days, where Satan is out to get us, and we have an us-them mentality, we're open for deception. Satan is going to get us. And so I want to talk a little bit about the structure of the book, I mean of the chapter, chapter 17, to get us an idea of this bigger picture about what's really going on here so we can see this and really know how we should relate to this. Not just as Christians, but as Adventist Christians living in the last days with this great message to give, how we are to associate ourselves with this. We're actually more involved in here than some might think. And so let's take a look at it here. I've got some PowerPoint I put together. I, I've done this in the past without it, and I put this together to kind of help uh, give you something to look at so that you don't fall asleep while we discuss this. So here, Revelation 17, the woman on the beast. This is the typical picture of it, one of the nicer pictures I like to look at. And I want us to understand this one part here. John is using the language of the past to write about the present and the future. Everything's in symbolic language. Remember Revelation 1, verse 1. John was to signify it. It was to be given out in great symbols. And what we've got here is the use of Babylon. Babylon appears in the book of Revelation for the first time in the second angel's message of Revelation 14, verse 8. It's the first time we see the word Babylon in the book of Revelation. And it's associated with, of course, the ancient city of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon, that held God's people captive. And that's going to be true at the end time. As the end time Babylon system has people, God's people, held captive. And this is the picture that we begin to see. Here's the first verses where John says, I saw the woman. She was sitting on a scarlet beast. She was full of blasphemous names. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered greatly. I wondered with admiration. He wasn't admiring her. And he just didn't wonder. He wondered greatly. Greatly did he wonder. Did I overemphasize this? You get the picture. John somehow saw this woman and was taken aback. Was aghast at what he saw. And the thing I want us to pick up here is that I think John recognized her. He had seen her a few chapters back. In chapter 12. When she was clothed with the sun. Standing on the moon with 12 stars over her head. When she was the church sent into the wilderness for the 1260. He saw her when she was pure, when she was a virgin, when she was a follower of Christ. And now he sees her entirely different. It is no wonder that Satan was angry with the remnant of her seed, went to make war with them at the end of chapter 12, those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. He saw her, but not this way. And so he wondered greatly at her. 
And when he saw her, he said, I wondered greatly. Was it because John recognized her? Yes. You recognize this? This is the symbol for Europe. This symbol right here. This is a, uh, the European Union. The woman who rides the bull or the beast. It's the myth of Europa. Gave her name to the continent. And according to the Greek mythology, uh, uh, what was it, Zeus, had uh, come down to uh, basically woo her. And he'd become the bull. And as he got close to her, she admired the bull so much, she climbed on his back and he took her. And so we have this symbol, which it seems to be apropos. This is an ancient symbol that goes back into the, about the 3rd century B.C. So I'm wondering if John was well aware of this symbol when he is describing and depicting this woman riding a beast. That he was taking this kind of language up in this chapter that people might recognize uh, this usurp, how uh, Satan would usurp uh, God's people using the same kind of symbol. And so, <coughs> if I can get close enough here to see this here, Europa is just provided like a substance of a brief Hellenistic epic written in the mid-2nd century, that's when it was written first, and uh, from a, uh, an old poem that they had found. And that's a, an old statue that was found in, uh, from that same time period where she's riding the beast. So this imagery, imaging goes way back. Um, so, remember, John is using the culture. He's using the language of the past to explain the present and the future. The past language is not confined just to the Old Testament. He's not just using Old Testament. He's using the culture in which he has lived in. He's using the other writings, what we call pseudepigrapha, the writings under another name, uh, the apocrypha, the hidden books, the books that weren't part of the canon, you know, all kinds of other writings that he's using. This is the basic structure of the book. Go with me to Revelation 17. Open that up. And normally when we read prophecy, sometimes it, it doesn't seem to break for us. And I want us to see that there's a couple things going on here. When you read prophecy, there's the vision part, where the prophet actually has the vision. And then there's the part where the angel or the messenger that's with him will describe what's going on. That's not vision. And that's generally called audition. Give you an example. Back in Daniel, Daniel chapter 9, where he gets the 70 weeks, that's not a vision. Daniel had no vision there. It was an angel come to him and spoke to him about this stuff about the vision he had had back in chapter 8 about time. And that's called an audition. Uh, the real technical word for it, as you see here, is called ekphrasis. This is a, an old Greek word which is used today in the art world to describe a piece of artwork. It's called an ekphrasis. Well, that's the audition. And so the book visually, uh, is essentially broken into two main parts. The vision, which is only verses 1 to 7. And then seven, only the first part. And then from the second part of verse seven down to the end of the chapter is audition. The angels talking about something. The first part, up to verse 13, we hear about the seven mountains or the seven kingdoms uh, that the woman sits on. And then from 13 to 18, I call the drying up of the Euphrates. Chapter 17 is an enlargement. When we read, for instance, the six, I mean the seven seals, chapter 6 uh, of the book of Revelation, the sixth and seventh seal was divided by chapter 7. Remember the seventh seal was chapter 8, verse 1. There was silence for the space of a half an hour. In between the sixth and seventh seals caught an interlude. Chapter 7 was 144,000. That was the question that was asked at the end of chapter 6 when they saw the Lord coming in the clouds, and the question was, who was able to stand? Hence, chapter 7 is inserted. That answers the question. And then we have the seventh seal. The seven last plagues don't have an interlude. They don't have chapters inserted between the plagues, like we did with the seals and we do with the trumpets. 
Instead, we have these two chapters, 17 and 18, that come at the end after the plagues. The plagues are in chapter 16. They're introduced in chapter 15, verses 5 to 8. That's the sanctuary introductory scene. Smoke fills the temple. No one can go in until the plagues have been fallen. And then we had the plagues fall in chapter 16. Now chapter 17 and 18 is like those interlude chapters. It's an enlargement, more detailed story of the plagues. What's going on in chapter 16? More specifically, that sixth plague. Remember when I spoke about it last week? I mean, last, last month? This is a test. Anybody want to? No one's going to take me up on it? This, this is when the sixth plague, you know, remember the plague fell into the river Euphrates, dried up the river, prepared the way for the kings of the east. And this is what we've got happening here in chapter 17 and 18. Chapter 17 tells us about this woman. There's the vision. Now the angel's going to describe some things. And in the description, we're going to talk about how God dries up the enemy of God's people. That's the river Euphrates. And how he moves them out of the way. And then chapter 18 is an enlargement of that last part of chapter 17 and how it's done. When that angel from heaven, who lightens the earth with his glory, joins with the second angel's message, and God does the work in restoring his people. So 18 is an enlargement off of 17. And we're just going to focus on 17 today because you didn't want me here all day long. Otherwise, it would be too long. Uh, we can talk about 18 at another time. But if you get a handle kind of like what's happening with 17, then you see the picture and it's easier then to kind of pick up on the story on what's going on. Here we have the description of what's happening with the beast. And this is in verse 8. This verse is really an important verse. I'm going to turn to mine in my scripture here rather than reading it off the screen. Go to yours because you'll see some different translations from what, what we have. And, and I, for one, I like different translations. I like it when your Bible is different than mine because we have English translations of the Greek. You can all, don't always translate exactly the same. And anyone who speaks two languages know that. And so when we have different translations, they kind of help us see and identify what was in the original text, what was in the Greek, how did it come through, and it helps us get a handle on what's being described there. So verse 8 is a description of who this beast was, because remember, the last part of verse 7, the angel, what did he say? John, I'm going to tell you who this woman is. And so we find out right here in verse 8, the real crux of who this person is. He says in verse 8, The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss and go to destruction. And those who dwell on the earth whose names has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will wonder when they see the beast that he was and is not and will come. Now is that clear as soup? You get that? I really like this here because this is an ellipse. This is bookend by this little epitaph about was, is, and we kind of get this here. I mean, who uses this? The beast that was, is not, and is about to come? That's an epitaph that's really applied to who? It's applied to Jesus. Keep your thumbs here. Go back to chapter 1 of Revelation. There's a couple places there. I'm going to take us, I think, verse 8 is a nice one. Jesus is speaking here, and he simply says, I am the Alpha the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and, and who is to come, the Almighty. So who does the epitaph apply to? Jesus. We see it there in, John, in verse 4. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him, who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before the throne. This is, this is Christ. And yet we see it being applied here at the end time system, the beast who comes up out of the abyss. What is the abyss? Just a hole in the ground? Is that all it is? What is the abyss that it comes up out of? We see the abyss in chapter 9 with the plagues. The locusts who come up out of the abyss. 
is the abode of Satan. It's also been associated, in chapter 17 here, we, we might catch this here today, it's been associated with the waters that she sits on. Go back to chapter 17, go back up to verse 2. We're talking about the great harlot who sits with the kings on the earth and acts uh, immorally. And those who dwell on the earth were made to drink of the wine of her immorality. Where was, where's the waters? I thought the waters. Oh, oh I'm sorry. It's, it's at the end of verse 1. Excuse me. Come here, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. So she's not just sitting on a beast. She starts out sitting on many waters. We're going to find out who the waters are. But she sits on water, she sits on the beast, and she, we're going to see that she sits on seven mountains. Those three things. It's those three things together that's going to form that end time alliance that's going to take the world by storm. And so here we have this picture, a description of the abyss that this beast we see who takes the epitaph of Jesus. This is who he is. Who is this beast? It's Satan himself. It's the abode of Satan. We've seen him described right here. He's the one who was and is not and is about to come. He's taken that epitaph to himself. But he goes to destruction, the verse says. Those who dwell on the earth, remember that phrase. I've told you several times here. That phrase represents those who don't believe. About ten times in the book of Revelation, there's that phrase, those who dwell on the earth. And it's in reference to unbelievers. And those who dwell on the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will wonder. They're going to be astonished at this beast when they see the beast that he was, is not, and will come. And then he says in verse 9, Here is the mind which has wisdom. This is the mind that has wisdom. The seven heads of seven mountains on which the woman sets. Wisdom. What's he mean by wisdom? Does he mean let him have good intellect? Are we going to not be deceived at the end because we're smarter than somebody else? We're not going to be deceived because we have the truth? Sometimes that can be a dangerous thing. I mean, if we have the truth, who says they're the truth? Jesus Christ alone. If you got truth, it better be in Christ. Not a bunch of knowledge. James chapter 1, verse 5, says some, He who wants wisdom, let him ask. God will give without reproach. God will give us wisdom if we ask. And this wisdom is spiritual insight. And we see it in the book of Revelation back at, ch at the end of chapter 13. When we see the number 666. And now it's being applied here. Wisdom. We're, we're to ask for spiritual understanding. To understand this phrase. The seven heads are seven mountains. What does that mean? This is the beginning section here by the way. Of the what's called the audition. Is the angels describing who the beast is in verse 8. That's the main description of who this beast is. That's what's behind it. Satan himself. That which comes out of the abyss. And here's the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads of seven mountains on which the woman sits. And what we need to begin to see here is that this beast system didn't just appear out of nowhere. It wasn't just all of a sudden there at the end time to deceive God's people. But this has been going on for a long, long time. This is all part of what we understand is the great controversy, excuse me, is the great controversy thing, the battle that's going on between Christ and Satan. And we're in the middle of it. But we don't have to be passive sideline people getting beat up. We're part of God's army here to take back the kingdom. So we need to know our place in this. And this is what I said earlier. We're involved here. We need to know where we're at in here. How we're involved in this. This isn't a chapter that we have to react to. That's what we've been doing a lot. Is reacting to it. 
wondering how we're going to be isolated from this, protected from this end time system. You know, we got Adventists who are doomsday preppers. I'm amazed. Garages full of meals ready to eat, stuff like that. I'm astounded. I mean, Ellen White was clear. She says, anytime we start packaging, you know, storing up stuff for this end time, she says, it's going to be taken from us. So if you're doomsday prepping and, and you really are an Adventist and want to be a believer, well, stop that. It's going to be taken from you. She says our bread and water is sure. God will take care of us through. It didn't say it's going to be a good time. I didn't, I didn't, didn't, say, I didn't say we're not going, to, they're not going to be suffering or anything. But he will take care of us. And besides, we have a different escape plan, don't we? I'm not looking to survive through the end time just so I can set up housekeeping on this destroyed earth at the, at the other side of it. We're talking about a new earth, right? With the new city. And so we have a different plan. And God will take care of us through that. And he's already provided for our escape. He's got that all worked out. And that's what we begin to see here. This and the sixth plague. That's all part of our escape. God getting us out of here. And so we have in the description this woman sitting on the seven mountains. And we get the clue now when John says, They are seven kings. Now he's not talking about kings as in singular, seven people. When they use the word king, it's in reference to kingdoms. And as the woman sits on mountains, if somebody here has a new intelligent version, I mean the NIV, uh, you, you'll see the word he sits on seven hills. The word hill is not there in the Greek, it's mountain. There is a separate word for hill, and if I figured if John meant hills, he would have used the word hills. He uses the word mountain. Now the reason why the NIV uses the word hills is because it has an influence from translators who have what's called a preterist background. And preterism says that this stuff has already happened in the past. And they relate this woman sitting on the seven mountains as a woman sitting on the seven hills of Rome. And they automatically associate that to her. Now that's easy for some Adventists to pick up on because if she's sitting on the mountain or the seven hills of Rome, then certainly she has to be Roman Catholicism. And it's easy for us to focus on her just being led by the papacy. This is Roman Catholicism. And that sets up this disconnect in our minds that it's not us. That's where we get in trouble. The bigger picture we need to see here is that, yeah, it's, it's all that and more. The woman is the church from chapter 12 who's gone bad. She's religion gone bad. And that includes you and me. When you look in the mirror, you see all the stuff that's there that's capable of rebelling against God and making religion go bad. Even Martin Luther, who was quick to call the Pope Antichrist, said the Pope he feared the most was self-Pope, the Pope that was within him. And we need to see this woman not just as some great institutions as the uh, Roman Catholic Church, but as all religion gone bad. All of it. And when we do, we can begin to be isolated then from what, what's going to happen with us. We don't feel necessarily feel that we're so safe. We're on guard. Because Satan's not just after the Catholics. He's after you. It's not just Catholic people. It's everybody. So I guess I just use Catholic again, because that's what Catholic means. Universal, everybody. It's everyone. And that's what we have to really begin to see this woman at, as, as religion gone bad. And that's why Satan is so angry with the remnant. That's why he's going after what's left of her seed, to destroy everything. He thinks he can actually win. It's amazing. So John says here that this... These five kings, he says of them, five have fallen. One is, and the other is not yet come. Here's my, here's my chart here, and I, I jumped right through hills here. And I see how boring that would be. Aren't you glad I just jumped right through that? That would have put me to sleep for sure. 
Here's, a, here's a, another thing that might, you might find interesting or not is dealing with the seven kingdoms. There's no hard and fast rule about how they're understood. We have some understanding through, say, for instance, Rankel Stavanovich and John Pauline. This is the side I generally lean to. I've, I've dealt with the other sides. In fact, I know Ramir Vetney, and I have his book, and he and I have communicated. He has some interesting points. He's got an interesting list, which is very similar, but a little different toward the end, that of uh, Mervyn Maxwell's book, which we see that list in volume two of God Cares. Anybody have the God Cares set? And you can go home and check that out and see how Mervyn lays out the, the, the kingdoms. This is why I see it in the first list. John is talking about five were, one is, one is yet to come. Others have associated this with the uh, epitaph that he was, is not, and is, will come. And so when John says one is, they want to associate that one is with the same period of is not. That's when the wound was, was initiated, which is yet future in John's day. But this is in a audition. This is in where John is talking to the angel. He's not in vision. And usually when you're just talking, not in vision, when things are and are not, they take place in real time. It's in vision now they can take place at any time, past, present, future. But in the audition, they're going to take place in real time. And here in the audition, John is saying five were, that's before me here in the first century. One is, that's one who exists right now in the first century. And one is yet to come, that is one is yet to come after the first century. And then the beast, he is the eighth, he's of the seven. And so when I look at it this way, I have to ask then, who are the seven hills? The seven kingdoms that were a threat to God's people over time. Remember, this beast just didn't show up out of nowhere. This system had been going on time after time, century after century, and God's people have been caught in the middle of it. And it goes all the way back to Egypt, when God's people were held captive there. Remember, Moses shows up, let my people go, God says. And Pharaoh says, who's Yahweh that I should let your people go? I got him in prison. Look, they're all slaves. Who's he? He's got no power. Then God shows up in Egypt, and he shows that he was God, not just in Canaan land, but God in Egypt as well. And with a mighty arm, he takes him out of Egypt. And so we begin with Egypt. And then the northern kingdom is taken at the end of the uh, 8th century B.C. by Sennacherib, the Assyrian. So it's the Assyrians, another. They come down to Judah, surround the city. They're almost going to take that, and then they pull away. And they got another 100 years of peace before Nebuchadnezzar comes. And now Judah is taken captive to Babylon. You know? Then that's followed by the Medes and the Persians. And that's followed by Greece, Alexander, and then the Seleucid Empire, with Antiochus Epiphanes, who actually wanted to Hellenize, Greek, make the people Greek, and do away with uh, Judaism entirely. That's where he was cutting people's limbs off and frying them in these large frying pans on the altar there in the sanctuary. What a way to go. You know, that, we talk about how he sacrificed a pig, that's one thing, but it's bad enough to cut someone's arms and legs off and then throw them on a hot frying pan unto the altar and fry him alive. He did that to two sons in front of their mother. And so this is the persecution. And then the one is, is the Roman Empire, which was of John's day. And that means then the one that was to come was the papal Rome. And then he would receive its wound. And that's the eighth, who's of the seven, is the eighth kingdom restored come back to life. And the point is this. Um, the restoration of this last beast system. As we look at what's happening and we look at Catholicism and we've made our statements as a church over the centuries, at least the last 150 some years, 
we start talking about the healing of the wound when? It's the Lantern Treaty, 1929. And sometimes we think that that's when it was healed. Well, that was only the beginning. The wound is not healed yet. You know that. That's yet future. You see, the papacy lost its, the papal states. It actually didn't lose the papal states until, you might be surprised, until 1870. 72 years after Berthier takes the Pope prisoner. That's when they fully lost, finally and forever lost, the papal states. Less than 60 years later, Mussolini signing a treaty with them and gives them the property there, not Vatican City, and does not restore the papal states. But that's just the beginning. That's just the, the door is beginning to open for the Pope to move. But there's no restoration. This healing of the wound is when this system has world domination. That's not yet. That is still future. We can look around us, we can see the signs of the times, we can see things happening that can bring that about. But it's not here yet. And that's the situation that John sees with the woman setting on the hills. We see this system in chapter 17 with religion gone bad, associated with the beast, which is the political system, taking the world by storm, and that's an end time system. This is also different than how it was in the past. You see, back in the pagan days, back in the B.C.s and the early A.D.s, nations were religio-political. They mixed religion with their politics. Here in America, when we organized as a country, we separated the two. And so we see here a separation, two distinct groups who have united as a confederacy to come back to the same thing, a religio-political system in order to control God's people. And that's what we see here in these verses at the beginning of the description of who this beast was and what it's doing. We see the bigger picture, the bigger story, that this beast, dragon, is not just an end time beast, but has been fighting God's people all across the centuries. This is just the culmination of it. Now God's preparing his people for something different. The uh, woman sets on many waters, verse 1. In verse 3, the scarlet beast. Verse 9, she sets on seven mountains. The waters represent, we've talked about that last time I was here. Does anybody remember what the waters represent? Don't just say people. You, you, can't, you can't just say people. It's the enemies of God's people. And we saw this in Isaiah chapter 8 didn't we? When Assyria came down, it was a, the Assyria was, the, the Euphrates River was used as a, a sign or symbol for the Assyrians who come down to Judah. Remember, they were up to their necks in Assyrians. They weren't overwhelmed. They weren't vanquished, just threatened by them. And then the Assyrians pulled back away. The Euphrates became this barrier between it and the other side was God's enemies and south of it was okay. And even though you look at the nations that attacked Israel, they were more to the east, they all had to come up the Euphrates Valley area, the Euphrates-Tigris River Valley, and come down from the north. So they were always invaded from the north, is where the invasion came from. So their enemies were up there at the Euphrates. And so we have those, the river Euphrates, the enemy of God's people. Those are the people that are in Babylon, and some of them probably don't even know they're in there. We have the woman, um, the scarlet beast, which is the political system. This is the leaders of the world who's joined with the woman. And then the seven mountains, which gives us this bigger picture that this system has been ongoing for centuries. Now, if we look at the long history of, of Moses, we we'll go back to 1500 B.C. So for over 3,500 years, we see this going on. That's how long it's been going on. You add the 400 years of captivity, we're close to 4,000 years of Satan attacking God's people. This is the culmination, chapter 17. This is the final attack to deceive God's people. This is the picture that we saw. Because remember, this is the enlargement of the sixth plague. And when the frog-like spirits came out of the mouth of the false prophets 
and of the uh, sea beast and of the red dragon, of the unholy trinity. This was the symbol of the demons going forth into the world to deceive the kings. Gather them together for the final battle, which was a spiritual battle. The battle of Armageddon. To take our souls. So, this is that enlargement of it. The, um, we talked about those who draw on the earth. That, that I've already done with that. Chapter 17, like I said, is the enlargement of the sixth plague of the Euphrates. And this will work. There we go. The sixth plague dries up the river Euphrates. And that's why this section is referred to as the drying up of the Euphrates. It's that symbol out of the sixth plague, which is drying up of the enemies of God, so that God can prepare to take his people, prepare for their escape. And so what Cyrus did there, literally, in order to take the city of Babylon, God is doing through destroying his, and the enemies of his people just at the end. And so the sixth angel poured out, this is the, the, uh, uh, the plague itself, poured out his bowl upon the great river Euphrates, and the water was dried up so that the way was prepared for the kings of the east. The king's plural is the king singular, Jesus Christ, the one who wears many crowns. Yeah. And he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sat are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Well, we know they're people, but these people are the enemy of God's people. They're not just people. And these include not just the leaders, but people who are in the system and may not even know that they're part of the Babylonian system. May not know that. We see that in the political world around us today, where people are looking to the political leaders to take care of them. This last election was just a nightmare. But that's the mindset of the people, as they reach out to these leaders to take care of them. They're looking to the government and to organizations to supply their need. And of course, when they don't, what happens? They, they're going to turn on them. And we see that here in the story as well. The enemy of God's people in the waters representing people equate to the river Euphrates, which in the Bible is the symbol of the enemy of God's people. And we saw that in chapter 9. I mean, chapter 8, verses 9. This is the, uh, the verse in, in 9, which says, Now behold, the Lord is about to bring on them, that's Judah, the strong and abundant waters of the Euphrates, even the king of Assyria. The king of Assyria is used here in the symbol of the water of the Euphrates. He will rise up over his channels, go over its banks, and will come down to Judah. Well, there's not enough water to go down to Judah, especially let alone cover up to their necks. It's just a symbol. So the drying up of the river Euphrates represents the vanquishing of the enemy of the people of God so that the way could be prepared for their deliverance. And that's what we have. The, the way that only prepared for the kings from the east. And that's preparing for Jesus to come. That's what this is about. Vanquishing the enemies of God people Preparing for your deliverance. Because we're held captive in Babylon. And that's the drying up here. Let's look at the rest of these verses here. We'll start with verse 15, which we had just read. And they said to me, The waters which you saw where the harlot sets are people, multitudes, nations, and tongues. The ten horns which you saw and the beast, those who uh, will hate the harlot, and will make her desolate. My eyes are going blurry on me. There we go. And naked and will eat her flesh and will burn her up with fire. The ten horns, when we have no exact identity of who the ten horns are here. These are the end time nations who join with the beast system in order to uh, have this religious political power. And when she's destroyed, they turn on her. And like in the Old Testament can, uh, Mosaic law, a harlot was stoned or burned stripped naked. They treat her the same way. Not because they hate her as much as she, because of their, her failure, they're no longer making money. We see this enlarged in the next chapter, 18, where the symbol is the, uh, uh, the great commercial cities who are sinking into the ocean because of what happened. Uh, so, that eat her flesh, burn her with fire. For God has put it in their hearts to execute his purpose by having a common purpose and by giving their kingdom to the beast until the words of God will be fulfilled. God somehow punishes the system by using the very people. He drives them to turn on it 
And they wreak out the punishment of God. You know, he did that with Nebuchadnezzar when he punished uh, Judah. He was the one who was, he was their rod, his rod. But because of Nebuchadnezzar or Babylon's um, intense uh, abuse of the people of God, they suffered as well. They weren't just letting God use them to punish his people. They really, really hurt them. And so we see the same thing. God is using the people. He put it in their hearts so that when this happens, they will actually take care of God's will. The woman then is simply described in verse 18. The woman whom you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. And so she, the religious political system, becomes the center at the end of time. And this is the culmination of all that's been going on in all these centuries as God prepares for the delivery of his people. It's enlarged then in chapter 18 when that fourth angel comes from heaven, lightens the earth with his glory, joins with the second angel, and declares that Babylon has fallen, and then prepares for those who come out of Babylon. Those many who don't even know they're in Babylon will come out. I know Ellen White says in great controversy around page 640 something that most of the, uh, most of the church, most of the God's people are in other churches. So we have a work to do ahead of us as we prepare for this here. And so this is the basic outline of 17. And when we think of it as just a religion gone bad and not just looking at one particular group of people, we'll be more ready to receive what God wants us to receive as far as the warnings go. Otherwise, we're open for deception on the side. Because if we think that's the deception over there, we think we're safe and we could be stepping into a landmine. So let's keep our eyes open for that. And if you want wisdom, pray for wisdom. That's spiritual discernment. And God is happy to give that. That's James 1, verse 5. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that uh, you have prepared the way that you know what's going to happen at the end and that you've set things in such a way that your people will be, de will be delivered and that we can avoid deception, not because we're smart, but because we trust that you'll give us spiritual insight to do what we need to do as we prepare for these days ahead. And it's not just looking to resist and, and escape uh, the destruction, but we see your hand at work. And in this process, Father, we ask that you will um, put your spirit within us, that we will go forward with the great message of restoring and bringing back the kingdom as your host, as your army, as we move forward. Every place we step, is new territory for the kingdom of Christ. And may we be faithful in that as we go forward to share our story, what you've done to bring us into the kingdom, that we might be a blessing to other people. Bless us now is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.